A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 5 I Elude My Watchdog. Sola stared into the brute's wicked looking eyes, muttered a word or two of command, pointed to me, and left the chamber. I could not but wonder what this ferocious looking monstrosity might do when left alone in such close proximity to such a relatively tender morsel of meat. But my fears were groundless, as the beast, after surveying me intently for a moment, crossed the room to the only exit which led to the street, and lay down full length across the threshold. This was my first experience with a Martian watchdog, but it was destined not to be my last for this fellow guarded me carefully during the time I remained a captive among these green men, twice saving my life, and never voluntarily being away from me a moment. While Sola was away, I took occasion to examine more minutely the room in which I found myself captive. The mural painting depicted scenes of rare and wonderful beauty. Mountains, rivers, lake, ocean, meadow, trees and flowers, winding roadways, sun-kissed gardens, scenes which might have portrayed earthly views but for the different colorings of the vegetation. The work had evidently been wrought by a master hand, so subtle the atmosphere, so perfect the technique, yet nowhere was there a representation of a living animal, either human or brute, by which I could guess at the likeness of these other, and perhaps extinct, denizens of Mars. While I was allowing my fancy to run riot in wild conjecture, on the possible explanation of the strange anomalies which I had so far met with on Mars, Sola returned bearing both food and drink. These she placed on the floor beside me, and seating herself a short ways off, regarded me intently. The food consisted of about a pound of some solid substance, the consistency of cheese, and almost tasteless, while the liquid was apparently milk from some animal. It was not unpleasant to the taste, though slightly acid, and I learned in a short time to prize it very highly. It came, as I later discovered, not from an animal, as there is only one mammal on Mars, and that one very rare indeed but from a large plant which grows practically without water, but seems to distill its plentiful supply of milk from the products of the soil, the moisture of the air, and the rays of the sun. A single plant of this species will give eight or ten quarts of milk per day. After I had eaten I was greatly invigorated, but feeling the need of rest I stretched out upon the silks and was soon asleep. I must have slept several hours as it was dark when I awoke and I was very cold. I noticed that someone had thrown a fur over me, but it had become partially dislodged and in the darkness I could not see to replace it. Suddenly a hand reached out and pulled the fur over me, shortly afterwards adding another to my covering. I presumed that my watchful guardian was Sola, nor was I wrong. This girl alone, among all the green Martians with whom I came in contact, disclosed characteristics of sympathy, kindliness, and affection. Her ministrations to my bodily wants were unfailing, and her solicitous care saved me from much suffering and many hardships. As I was to learn, the Martian nights are extremely cold, and as there is practically no twilight or dawn, the changes in temperature are sudden and most uncomfortable, as are the transitions from brilliant daylight to darkness. The nights are either brilliantly illumined or very dark, for if neither of the two moons of Mars happen to be in the sky, almost total darkness results, since the lack of atmosphere, or rather the very thin atmosphere, fails to diffuse the starlight to any great extent. On the other hand, if both of the moons are in the heavens at night, the surface of the ground is brightly illuminated. Both of Mars' moons are vastly nearer her than is our moon to Earth, the nearer moon being but about five thousand miles distant, while the further is but little more than fourteen thousand miles away, against the nearly one quarter million miles which separates us from our moon. The nearer moon of Mars makes a complete revolution around the planet in a little over seven and one-half hours, so that she may be seen hurtling through the sky 
like some huge meteor, two or three times each night, revealing all her phases during each transit of the heavens. The further moon revolves about Mars in something over thirty and one-quarter hours, and with her sister satellite makes a nocturnal Martian scene one of splendid and weird grandeur. And it is well that nature has so graciously and abundantly lighted the Martian night. For the green men of Mars, being a nomadic race without high intellectual development, have but crude means for artificial lighting, depending principally upon torches, a kind of candle, and a peculiar oil lamp which generates a gas and burns without a wick. This last device produces an intensely brilliant, far-reaching white light, but as the natural oil which it requires can only be obtained by mining, in one of several widely separated and remote localities, it is seldom used by these creatures, whose only thought is for today, and whose hatred for manual labor has kept them in a semi-barbaric state for countless ages. After Sola had replenished my coverings, I again slept, nor did I awaken until daylight. The other occupants of the room, five in number, were all females, and they were still sleeping, piled high with a motley array of silks and furs. Across the threshold lay stretched the sleeping guardian brute, just as I had last seen him on the preceding day. Apparently he had not moved a muscle. His eyes were fairly glued upon me, and I fell to wondering just what might befall me should I endeavor to escape. I have ever been prone to seek adventure and to investigate and experiment where wiser men would have left well enough alone. It therefore now occurred to me that the surest way of learning the exact attitude of this beast toward me would be to attempt to leave the room. I felt fairly secure in my belief that I could escape him should he pursue me once I was outside the building, for I had begun to take great pride in my ability as a jumper. Furthermore, I could see from the shortness of his legs that the brute himself was no jumper, and probably no runner. Slowly and carefully, therefore, I gained my feet, only to see my watcher did the same. Cautiously I advanced toward him, finding that by moving with a shuffling gait I could retain my balance as well as make reasonably rapid progress. As I neared the brute he backed cautiously away from me, and when I had reached the open he moved to one side to let me pass. He then fell in behind me and followed about ten paces in my rear as I made my way along the deserted street. Evidently his mission was to protect me only, I thought, but when we reached the edge of the city he suddenly sprang before me, uttering strange sounds and bearing his ugly and ferocious tusks. Thinking to have some amusement at his expense, I rushed toward him and when almost upon him sprang into the air, alighting far beyond him and away from the city. He wheeled instantly and charged me with the most appalling speed I had ever beheld. I had thought his short legs a bar to swiftness, but had he been coursing with greyhounds the latter would have appeared as though asleep on a doormat. As I was to learn, this was the fleetest animal on Mars and owing to its intelligence, loyalty, and ferocity, is used in hunting, in war, and as the protector of the Martian man. I quickly saw that I would have difficulty in escaping the fangs of the beast on a straightaway course, and so I met his charge by doubling in my tracks and leaping over him as he was almost upon me. This maneuver gave me a considerable advantage, and I was able to reach the city quite a bit ahead of him and as he came tearing after me I jumped for a window, about thirty feet from the ground in the face of one of the buildings overlooking the valley. Grasping the sill I pulled myself up to a sitting posture, without looking into the building, and gazed down at the baffled animal beneath me. My exultation was short-lived, however, for scarcely had I gained a secure seat upon the sill than a huge hand grasped me by the neck from behind and dragged me violently into the room. Here I was thrown upon my back, and beheld, standing over me, a colossal, ape-like creature, white and hairless, 
except for an enormous shock of bristly hair upon its head. Chapter 6 A Fight That Won Friends The thing, which more nearly resembled our earthly men than it did the Martians I had seen, held me pinioned to the ground with one huge foot, while it jabbered and gesticulated at some answering creature behind me. This other, which was evidently its mate, soon came toward us, bearing a mighty stone cudgel with which it evidently intended to brain me. The creatures were about ten or fifteen feet tall, standing erect, and had, like the green Martians, an intermediary set of arms or legs midway between their upper and lower limbs. Their eyes were close together and non-protruding. Their ears were high-set, but more laterally located than those of the Martians, while their snouts and teeth were strikingly like those of our African gorilla. Altogether they were not unlovely when viewed in comparison with the green Martians. The cudgel was swinging in the arc which ended upon my upturned face, when a bolt of myriad-legged horror hurled itself through the doorway, full upon the breast of my executioner. With a shriek of fear the ape which held me leaped through the open window, but its mate closed in a terrific death-struggle with my preserver, which was nothing less than my faithful watch-thing. I cannot bring myself to call so hideous a creature a dog. As quickly as possible I gained my feet, and backing against the wall I witnessed such a battle as it is vouchsafed few beings to see. The strength, agility, and blind ferocity of these two creatures is approached by nothing known to earthly man. My beast had an advantage in his first hold, having sunk his mighty fangs far into the breast of his adversary. But the great arms and paws of the ape, backed by muscles far transcending those of the Martian men I had seen, had locked the throat of my guardian, and slowly were choking out his life and bending back his head and neck upon his body, where I momentarily expected the former to fall limp at the end of a broken neck. In accomplishing this the ape was tearing away the entire front of its breast, which was held in the vice-like grip of the powerful jaws. Back and forth upon the floor they rolled, neither one emitting a sound of fear or pain. Presently I saw the great eyes of my beast bulging completely from their sockets, and blood flowing from its nostrils. That he was weakening perceptibly was evident, but so also was the ape, whose struggles were growing momentarily less. Suddenly I came to myself, and with that strange instinct which seems ever to prompt me to my duty, I seized the cudgel, which had fallen to the floor at the commencement of the battle, and swinging it with all the power of my earthly arms, I crashed it full upon the head of the ape, crushing his skull as though it had been an eggshell. Scarcely had the blow descended when I was confronted with a new danger. The ape's mate, recovered from its first shock of terror, had returned to the scene of the encounter by way of the interior of the building. I glimpsed him just before he reached the doorway, and the sight of him, now roaring as he perceived his lifeless fellow stretched upon the floor, and frothing at the mouth, in the extremity of his rage, filled me, I must confess, with dire forebodings. I am ever willing to stand and fight when the odds are not too overwhelmingly against me, but in this instance I perceive neither glory nor profit in pitting my relatively puny strength against the iron muscles and brutal ferocity of this enraged denizen of an unknown world. In fact, the only outcome of such an encounter, so far as I might be concerned, seemed sudden death. I was standing near the window, and I knew that once in the street I might gain the plaza and safety, before the creature could overtake me. At least there was a chance for safety in flight, against the almost certain death should I remain and fight however desperately. It is true I held the cudgel, but what could I do with it against his four great arms? Even should I break one of them with my first blow, for I figured that he would attempt to ward off the cudgel, he would reach out and annihilate me with the others before I could recover for a second attack. In the instant that these thoughts passed through my mind 
I had turned to make for the window, but my eyes alighting on the form of my erstwhile guardian threw all thoughts of flight to the four winds. He lay gasping upon the floor of the chamber, his great eyes fastened upon me in what seemed a pitiful appeal for protection. I could not withstand that look, nor could I, on second thought, have deserted my rescuer without giving as good an account of myself in his behalf as he had in mine. Without more ado, therefore, I turned to meet the charge of the infuriated bull-ape. He was now too close upon me for the cudgel to prove of any effective assistance, so I merely threw it as heavily as I could at his advancing bulk. It struck him just below the knees, eliciting a howl of pain and rage, and so throwing him off his balance that he lunged full upon me with arms wide stretched to ease his fall. Again, as on the preceding day, I had recourse to earthly tactics, and swinging my right fist full upon the point of his chin, I followed it with a smashing left to the pit of his stomach. The effect was marvelous, for as I lightly sidestepped after delivering the second blow, he reeled and fell upon the floor doubled up with pain and gasping for wind. Leaping over his prostrate body, I seized the cudgel and finished the monster before he could regain his feet. As I delivered the blow, a low laugh rang out behind me, and turning I beheld Tars Tarkas, Sola, and three or four warriors standing in the doorway of the chamber. As my eyes met theirs, I was, for the second time, the recipient of their zealously guarded applause. My absence had been noted by Sola on her awakening, and she had quickly informed Tars Tarkas, who had set out immediately with a handful of warriors to search for me. As they had approached the limits of the city, they had witnessed the actions of the bull-ape as he bolted into the building, frothing with rage. They had followed immediately behind him, thinking it barely possible that his actions might prove a clue to my whereabouts, and had witnessed my short but decisive battle with him. This encounter, together with my set-to with the Martian warrior on the previous day, and my feats of jumping, placed me upon a high pinnacle in their regard. Evidently, devoid of all the finer sentiments of friendship, love, or affection, these people fairly worship physical prowess and bravery, and nothing is too good for the object of their adoration as long as he maintains his position by repeated examples of his skill, strength, and courage. Sola, who had accompanied the searching party of her own volition, was the only one of the Martians whose face had not been twisted in laughter as I battled for my life. She, on the contrary, was sober with apparent solicitude, and as soon as I had finished the monster, rushed to me and carefully examined my body for possible wounds or injuries. Satisfying herself that I had come off unscathed, she smiled quietly and, taking my hand, started toward the door of the chamber. Tars Tarkas and the other warriors had entered and were standing over the now rapidly reviving brute which had saved my life, and whose life I in turn had rescued. They seemed to be deep in argument, and finally one of them addressed me, but remembering my ignorance of his language, turned back to Tars Tarkas who, with a word and gesture, gave some command to the fellow, and turned to follow us from the room. There seemed something menacing in their attitude toward my beast, and I hesitated to leave until I had learned the outcome. It was well I did so, for the warrior drew an evil-looking pistol from its holster, and was on the point of putting an end to the creature, when I sprang forward and struck up his arm. The bullet striking the wooden casing of the window exploded blowing a hole completely through the wood and masonry. I then knelt down beside the fearsome-looking thing, and raising it to its feet, motioned for it to follow me. The looks of surprise which my actions elicited from the Martians were ludicrous. They could not understand, except in a feeble and childish way, such attributes as gratitude and compassion. The warrior, whose gun I had struck up, looked inquiringly at Tars Tarkas, but the latter signed that I be left to my own devices, and so we returned to the plaza with my great beast following close at heel, and Sola grasping me tightly by the arm. I had at least two friends on Mars, 
a young woman who watched over me with motherly solicitude, and a dumb brute which, as I later came to know, held in its poor ugly carcass more love, more loyalty, more gratitude than could have been found in the entire five million green Martians who roved the deserted cities and dead sea-bottoms of Mars. End of chapter 6